Hello, I'm Professor Jean Fan. I lead a research team in the Center for Computational Biology at Johns Hopkins University. And today I'll be teaching you a little bit about our work on pathway and gene set over dispersion analysis for characterizing single cell transcriptional heterogeneity. The central research question in my lab is how do different cells and cell types in our bodies do so many different things? A muscle cell looks very different from a skin cell from a nerve cell, that is, they exhibit phenotypic differences, but of course they display many functional differences as well. These phenotypic and functional differences are molecularly encoded in part based on coordinated patterns of gene expression, that is, different cell types express different genes, allowing them to do different things. And likewise, aberrations in the underlying regulatory mechanisms that control these coordinated patterns of gene expression may result in the aberrant overexpression of certain genes, which ultimately manifest in diseases such as cancer. So by measuring what genes are expressed in individual cells, we may better understand what are the molecular underpinnings that differentiate different cell types, and likewise, what are the potential mechanisms driving different diseases, and we can even use these coordinated patterns of gene expression to identify potentially new cell types and cell states in the human body. Single cell RNA sequencing is one technology that's enabling researchers to measure what genes are expressed in individual cells. Using single cell RNA sequencing, we can now quantify the expression magnitudes for thousands of genes in the transcriptome across thousands to millions of single cells. And of course, given such big data, we really need computational methods to be able to make sense of it all. Unfortunately, a major challenge in analyzing single-cell RNA sequencing data is just how noisy the data is, owing in part to technical limitations. For example, if we were to consider a bulk RNA sequencing data set done in replicate, we would expect that genes detected at a particular expression magnitude in the first replicate be also detected at a comparable expression magnitude in the second replicate, resulting in this nice positive correlation in terms of gene expression across the two replicates. Unfortunately, when we look at single cell data, what we sometimes see is that a gene is highly expressed in one cell, but in the second replicate cell, it's not detected at all. And what we call this is a technical dropout. In order to accommodate these technical dropouts and other sources of technical variability, previous approaches such as SCDE have tried to use error modeling to get a better handle on this technical noise, specifically to distinguish between the technical dropouts and true biological non-expression. Now, by getting a better handle on this technical noise, we can then focus on more important and interesting biological aspects of variation in our data. Building on this prior error modeling, we then developed pathway and gene set over dispersion analysis, or PERGODA, to further integrate prior knowledge regarding biological pathways in order to characterize transcriptional heterogeneity and identify transcriptionally distinct cell populations in our single cell RNA sequencing data. The general intuition behind PERGODA is that we can improve statistical sensitivity by grouping genes into biological pathways and gene sets. For example, Consider this expression of one gene, DCX, which happens to be a neuronal maturation marker. Here, each column is a single cell. Red denotes high expression, and blue denotes low expression of this gene. If I were to suggest that we could group cells into two transcriptionally and perhaps functionally distinct groups based on this one marker gene alone, you'd be understandably a little skeptical because we know that in single cell RNA sequencing, measurements are liable to dropouts. So these cells with low detected expression may only have low detected expression for technical reasons. Rather than relying on this one gene to identify transcriptionally and perhaps functionally distinct groups of cells, we can improve our statistical sensitivity of identifying true underlying biological variability, as well as our general confidence by looking for broader patterns of variability linked to functions and phenotypes such as within known pathways and gene sets. So, if I were to show you a number of genes associated with the gene ontology nervous system development pathway, 
Now we can see a group of cells upregulating genes within this pathway in a coordinated manner, and likewise a group of cells downregulating genes within this pathway in a coordinated manner. And it becomes a lot less likely that technical factors such as dropout are responsible for all the low detected gene expression seen here, especially as these cells are also upregulating genes in other pathways. And therefore, this observed transcriptional heterogeneity is likely the result of true biological variation rather than technical factors. And generally, you'd be a lot more confident that there are indeed two transcriptionally and perhaps functionally distinct groups of cells. And we can summarize the primary aspect of transcriptional heterogeneity within this pathway using the first weighted principal component that takes into consideration our error modeling of dropouts. Here, orange can generally be interpreted as coordinated upregulation of genes within the pathway, whereas green can be interpreted as coordinated downregulation of genes within the pathway. Beyond testing a single pathway, we can test for all the pathways and gene sets within databases such as gene ontology. We can even augment existing databases with our own manually curated gene sets based on our own prior knowledge. And we will again summarize each of the provided pathways and gene sets using weighted principal components. We can also derive de novo gene sets based on correlated expression patterns we observe directly from the data. We assume that genes correlated in expression across the population of cells are likely functionally related as part of the same pathway or process. In the same way that not all genes are variable across all cells, not all pathway will capture underlying biological variability. So given all of these weighted principal components, we want to focus on the pathways and gene sets that exhibit more variability than what we would expect, that is, they're over-dispersed. Still, many pathways and gene sets share genes or show similar patterns of variability across cells. Therefore, we need to further collapse these redundancies into pathway clusters. And ultimately, we can provide to the investigator a hierarchical clustering of cells based on these pathway clusters, and also present an interactive browser to enable the exploration of these results. To demonstrate the utility of Pagoda, we applied it to single-cell RNA sequencing data of mouse neuroprogenitor cells. Again, here, each column is a cell. The cells have been organized via hierarchical clustering, and each row is a set of over-dispersed pathways represented as pathway clusters identified through our analysis. Generally, we can see two major groups of cells marked by upregulation of genes and pathways in these different pathway clusters. Looking into each pathway cluster, based on what are the pathway names and known function of genes driving this pathway cluster, we can begin interpreting these different aspects of transcriptional heterogeneity. Applying this approach, we can interpret this aspect of transcriptional heterogeneity that is being upregulated in this group of cells and downregulated in this group of cells as being related to nervous system development. And alternatively, we can focus on a different aspect of transcriptional heterogeneity, such as this one, that's being upregulated in a complementary subset of cells that's being driven by pathways and genes related to the negative regulation of neural differentiation and other DNA replication-related processes. And based on this approach, we can interpret and annotate the rest of the pathway clusters. Based on our prior knowledge regarding these different transcriptional processes in neuroprogenitor cells, we can interpret this major subpopulation of neuroprogenitor cells as the more early neuroprogenitors that are still undergoing different phases of the cell cycle. And this complementary major population of neuroprogenitor cells as the more intermediate and mature neuroprogenitors that are no longer upregulating factors associated with the cell cycle and instead expressing genes associated with neuronal maturation and other parts of nervous system development. 
as an orthogonal validation to our interpretation of these subpopulations of neuroprogenitor cells as being earlier versus more intermediate and mature neuroprogenitors, we can look to see where genes upregulated in these subpopulations are spatially localized in the mouse brain based on staining imaging data from the Allen Brain Atlas. It is well known that early neuroprogenitor cells are enriched in the ventricular zone and they migrate outwards through the subventricular zone towards the cortical plate during neuromaturation and early development. Indeed, when we look to see where genes upregulated in our earlier neuroprogenitor cells are expressed, such as Tyro3, they are indeed expressed in a spatial location that's closer to the ventricular zone. And likewise, genes upregulated in our more intermediate and mature neuroprogenitors such as NFAST-C, are spatially expressed in a location that's more outwards towards the cortical plate. This allows us to integrate all the genes that are differentially expressed between our two identified subpopulations into creating a predicted putative spatial placement for each subpopulation that is consistent with what is known regarding neuroprogenitor cell migration during development. Still, just like for these apples, we could split them based on color, but depending on what we are interested in, we may also just as validly split them based on sweetness or rottenness or any other aspect of heterogeneity. Likewise, for our neuroprogenitor cells, there are potentially many ways to group them beyond this primary component of transcriptional variation. That is, the early versus mature divide represents only one way to group our neuroprogenitor cells into transcriptionally distinct subpopulations. Perhaps we're just not that interested in the early versus more intermediate and mature neuroprogenitor divide. So it becomes important to be able to look at additional, potentially overlapping aspects of transcriptional heterogeneity. For example, Perhaps we want to focus on an alternative aspect of transcriptional heterogeneity, such as this one related to the proximal distal pattern formation. And indeed, there are some earlier neuroprogenitor cells that are upregulating genes associated with this aspect of transcriptional heterogeneity, and also some more intermediate and mature neuroprogenitor cells. Indeed, when we look to see where genes upregulated in this proximal distal pattern formation aspect is expressed, such as DLX2 and PBX3, they do seem to mark a spatially distinct location in the brain, consistent with what is known about tangential migration of neuroprogenitor cells in the developing mouse brain. So although we do have this earlier and more mature neuroprogenitors here, and this heterogeneity in neuronal maturity is transcriptionally encoded and can be identified through our analysis, a cell's spatial location within the mouse brain can provide an alternative overlapping or cross-cutting aspect of transcriptional heterogeneity that is made apparent through our application of Pagoda. So I hope I've been able to show you how by taking a pathway-based approach, we can integrate prior knowledge to increase statistical power and provide interpretability of the identified transcriptionally distinct subpopulations and ultimately reveal multiple potentially overlapping aspects of transcriptional heterogeneity. Pathway and gene set over dispersion analysis is implemented as part of the SCD package, so if you would like more information on the software, please feel free to visit this website. Since the publication of Pagoda in 2016, we've really seen an exponential growth in terms of the experimental scale for single cell RNA sequencing experiments. And this exponential growth of experimental scale really demands more scalable and efficient computational solutions for data analysis. Luckily, newer and more scalable computational solutions are still actively being developed, including Pagoda 2, and likewise other approaches in my lab and others. And with that, I'd like to thank my co-authors on this work, in particular my mentor Peter Karchenko, and likewise all the funding mechanisms that made this research possible. 
And if you would like to learn more about computational biological research, access tutorials, and other resources, please feel free to visit us at our website at jef.works, and likewise on social media such as Twitter at jefworks. Thank you for your attention. Stay healthy and safe.